So last week, 30 releases, 113 songs sat from this desk, went out into the world, as in on Spotify, on Apple Music. And it was really humbling to look back and go, wow, that's probably the busiest, busiest week of releases I've had in 10 years working in this industry. But also, as I went through the releases, I realized there were some really interesting stories, really cool tips and tricks I'm going to share with you, but also really interesting hurdles and twists and turns I had to navigate through that period of time. So I'm going to share with you six lessons. Before I do, you're going to go into the description and subscribe to the best newsletter for working audio professionals, because if you're a working audio professional and you want to improve your skill sets or your business skill sets, so either in sessions or with your clients, that's the space to be. The newsletter is free and it is high level information for everyone. Now, let's jump into these six lessons for today. The first one was, okay, this one was a tricky one. Story time, because you guys are going to not laugh. I don't think it's fair to laugh because these things happen. Um, Sent out masters for an album. Sent out masters for the single. The single got released. I'm not going to say the name of this artist because I want to be, you know, like when something like this happens, a hip cup like this happens, I want to remain respectful in narrating a dialogue with you guys and sharing these stories as well. So the single gets released, everybody's happy, label's happy, producer's happy, everybody's hunky-dory, cool. We've got to finish up the EP. I finish up the EP, I get it out. The producer gets on the line to me and they're like to me, Nick, the artist has sent me a video and this track is distorting really loud on their system. And I'm like, that's really weird because we did the single, we... um, You've heard in your studio, they've heard in the studio with you. Like, there's, there's obviously nothing distorting that loud. So anyway, they send over the video of their system, which they've recorded on their phone. But as they go from their Spotify playlist to the master, the whole system craps out. And I'm like, okay, I have a theory of what this could be, but we're going to be delicate. So my theory was, and it ended up being correct, was that when they were listening or monitoring on Spotify at a nominal level, they had loudness normalization turned on. And then when they were listening to the master, which wasn't going through loudness normalization, it was overloading the system. It was just like where they had the system cranked to for Spotify, adding all that extra loudness into it, just overloaded the system and it broke up. So, you know, spoke with the producer, said, look, I really, you know, want to make sure we accommodate to the artist. So, you know, they feel happy and comfortable and confident in what they're doing before we even address saying this is what it could be. Let me print off a master at negative 14 luffs for them to audition. Not for them to release, but just so they can audition it against other Spotify releases they're listening to. Lo and behold, that was the issue and everything was sorted. But in the moment, the artist was really stressed. And rightfully so. You get a master back, you play it on your system and it's blabbing all and it's overloading. You're not going to be happy. So, you know, that first lesson is, you know, I think in the moment, because it was, they're very important clients to me, um, this producer is, is an incredibly nice, kind-hearted producer who works really hard for the artist, and I really wanted to make sure I was serving them and their clients as best as I could. Um, a bit of stress, to be honest, comes up. It's like, shit, something's distorting. Am I going to lose the job? Am I going to lose the clients? Are they not going to ever want to work with me anymore? And those things go through your mind. I think in this instance, I did a really good job of keeping a level head and just focusing on service, 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 accommodate, 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 and it did work out. Um, And for next time, something maybe just to have in my back pocket, uh, I think auditioning tools, I'm not sure what's out there, but um, for file delivery, that offers normalization. If you guys know any, let, let me know in the comment section below, because I think that can be a really healthy way for when people are flicking back and forth, maybe on their laptop between Spotify and the link I send them, they can have it already loudness normalized to their system. So that's lesson number one. Okay. That, that's one thing which happened. I'm not going to say the name of that record because, you know, I want to respect the people involved in that particular record um, because, you know, uh, the internet's an interesting space where people get a bit funny and I want to keep things cool. Now, the next lesson was really cool. So this is, this is a fun session I got up here. You guys are going to really enjoy this. All right. So I had this album. This album is Mindscape by Jay Brink or Johan Brink. And this album is gorgeous. You can see how I've sequenced it. Okay. We'll have a listen to one of the songs here. Yeah. It's 
gorgeous. Now, this album from one sec from one song to the next to the next, they were very different. Not very different, like stylistically they were together, but we wanted a super cohesive sound. So I'm going to take you through a bit of the process I did on this. So the first thing is I went all digital. I first sequenced, you know, where's my first track, second track, third track, made sure the crossovers and fade ins and outs were all, you know, all Gucci. So you can see there that one goes fade into that one, etc., etc. But then I have EQs. Okay, so I've got an EQ here on this one, either Pro Q3 or, or the um or the Sontech. So, you know, this one the sides are a little bit too wide, so I brought that in. Um, some of them had no EQ. They just went out to the analog chain. But basically what I did is um, I EQ'd each track, A being between each one, until they were all relatively balanced with one another. And then with the artist sitting here, Johan, we, we went through and just made sure each one was sort of tucked in and out of one another. So you can just see there's just little EQ changes. I'm not doing any compression here at the moment. Little EQ here, you know, little duck to the top. And, and then just to get the overall tonal balance for the whole album done. Then I played it back and I thought, well, what tracks needed that little bit of extra depth, which didn't? So some of these tracks you can see here have the output set to analog. And that analog output is actually my analog chain through my HVAQ, my Barry Porter EQ, the Manly Verimu. And only some of the tracks on this album, I actually went through the analog chain. And I've got multiple prints. So I've got commits down here of the analog so I can re-access them. And then I've also got different renders down here. And basically what this allowed me to do is get everything tonally balanced really nicely with EQ, um, then decide, well, which ones needed that bit of analog flavor, commit those, audition everything alongside one another, and then ultimately assemble what ends up being this album here in this middle section here. Actually, I think these green ones also were alternate versions which we could pick from in the final master, as in for the final master. Um, so this is just a really fun process. I really enjoyed this for this album. You can see um, where I've got commit last, do first, big subs, little notes, upper mids need to be up, upper mids need to be down, little notes just to help me tweak across the album. Um, and this is just a really pleasant album to work on. That's um, Mindscape by Jay Brink. And that got released this month. And that was that was really cool. And now I'll get you on to the next lesson. The third of six lessons and things that happened this month. This one I can't say the artist. I don't want to say the artist because it was a bit of a hit cup. Um, both on my part and, you know, sort of last minute. So I don't want the artist to come under fire because, you know, things happen. And I completely am cool with that. Some people on the internet are a little bit funny where they get a bit moany about clients and it's like, that's your thing. That's cool, but I'm going to leave it. So had an album come out, had multiple albums come out this, this month. So, you, you know, I'm not going to expose anybody by saying it was an album. So whatever. Um, album co is coming out the Saturday before the release day. I get a text message saying the last two tracks on the album haven't been sequenced correctly and the, the DDP or image also has to be updated for CD. And they needed it ASAP updated. Now, lesson for this, okay? Check your tops and tails, but I'm a human and an error happened. Not excusing it, just saying that was a situation. But lesson was I had to move my whole Monday over, as in slot a revision for the album at the start of the day, backlog my whole Monday and finish later because I didn't have a slot open. I'm usually pretty vigilant about leaving revision slots open in my calendar, but sometimes I fill them up in advance to my own detriment. I should be a little bit more stricter with myself to say, you know what, paying clients can wait an extra day as long as I have a revision slot open throughout the week. Just something, just a lesson to myself, a little note to myself. Keep, a, it's a half hour slot for revisions. That's all you really need. Keep revision slots always open each day. One half hour slot somewhere in the day. If something pops up, that's what's going to be used for. I'd already filled them up and then my Monday got pushed out because of it. It was just a small thing, but it's worth noting that I should be a little bit more vigilant on myself to keep those revision slots open and not book them out because I'm the one who pays the price. I never let the artist pay the price and go, oh, you're going to have to wait now till two weeks time. I pay it in the sense that my whole day gets pushed back. It's a longer day. 
there's less leisure time. It's, it's not like I need a leisurely life. It's just that I try to afford myself my downtime so I'm able to perform really good when I am in the studio. So that was just something that happened, which I remember. Um, oh, cool. I get to pull up a session now. Yes. This is a cool session. Wait till you see this mix. This is a very simple, where are we? A very simple tweak to the low end, like very simple, wildly simple, very simple tweak to the low end, but it made the 808 so damn consistent. It is not funny. I'll show you the before and after of the mix because it's a really cool before and after, but then I'm just going to detail. There was something the client asked about the 808. So this is by, this song is by Tom King and it's called I Ain't Hurt. One of the notes that they gave me before I started mixing was big, fat, consistent 808. I'm paraphrasing a little bit there, but basically it was like that 808 has to be there. Like it has to be there. If it's not there, I'm not doing a good job on the mix. So I'll pull up this mix and we'll have a chat about it. Boom, here we are. So we'll go before and after. <laughs> It's just huge, the 808. Now, there are a few things I did, but probably I'm going to attribute this to my session preparation and organization. At the start, when I started working with these 808s, you can see these track markers down below. Okay. I've got fund, which is the fundamental level, and the LUFS. Now, basically, I tracked every single note, the fundamental level, um, from one note to the next, and then gain adjusted the volume of that note up and down. So the fundamental frequency, the lowest sub frequency of the 808 looped was always consistently the exact same amount of energy pumping out of the speakers. And then I just copied that across all the 808s. You've seen me do similar things like this before, but I just thought this was something a client was bang on saying we want the 808s to hit. And it was a small little tweak early on in the process before doing any parallel, before doing anything else, which I did early on to set myself up for an easy mix. It wasn't an easy mix. It was a fun mix, but like this was just a little stepping stone to help me out throughout that process. Next note was another really cool record. Uh, this was Gladiolus's record. I'm going to leave, I haven't upload, downloaded the session from my drive onto here, but the, this album was mixed by Mike Trebesco. Really great album. Really cool album. Great sound. Um, got the sent off the masters. Everybody's loving it. And then there's a few songs which need a little bit more upper mids to help the guitars carry, cut through, so to speak. And for me, I had to trust in, even though I felt the master was well balanced, I had to trust in the process and the expertise of the artists as guitarists and Mike who's a producer, a metal producer who knows guitar tone way better than I do. I took their direction. I made the changes and guess what? It sounded much better. I sort of blindly made the changes. They're like, we want a little bit more upper mids around 3K. So I pulled up the session, I bumped 3K, half a dB, a dB, and then I've AB'd it blind. And I'm like, cool, that certainly sounds better. And this is just a lesson to take your client's direction. Oftentimes, your clients might give you notes that you go, oh, do you do I need to do that? Are you, are you sure? But if you carry through with what they're suggesting, often it can lead to some really interesting results and great sounds. Now, the final one, it's not really a lesson. It's just more a pleasure, a pleasure to have worked on. Um, and this is probably like an honorable mention. I won't call it a sixth lesson. Was the artist Lef, Mirror's Gaze, his EP, um, it was mixed by Jim McRae over in the UK and this project, you would have seen me actually on two videos ago where I moved the Michelangelo before and after the Clipper. This EP was just beautiful to work on. The sounds, the arrangements, the mix, the sonic textures were just great. And the lesson from that is to sometimes just enjoy the ride, I guess. Sometimes you're just going to get given, oftentimes I'm very fortunate to get given really fun music, which I really love. Um, this particular EP was something that um, every now and then you get something that crosses your desk that connects with you on a very personal level. You just listen to it and you're like, wow, I, I could 
I could imagine loving and listening to this music 10 years ago, in 10 years' time, five years ago, in my car. Even if I didn't work on it, I would probably want to listen to this record. This is beautiful. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to give that record an honourable mention. The mixes were outstanding. I really loved working on it. It's it's a really good piece. Um, and anyway, with that, I'm going to leave you to it. I've been babbling on. This is a bit of a, a long journal entry, but I feel like there's nice little tidbits in here. People are probably going to go, well, you, you're not giving me the YouTube juice, the YouTube quick dopamine hit, but this is what this video is about today. And until next time, take care.